The Dick Hewer sessions are all about gaining clarity of thought, using the tools and tips in the book, Psychology of Intelligence Analysis, to become an improved critical thinker who can make better decisions and more accurate judgments. Arguably, the most famous chapter of the book is chapter eight, which deals with the analysis of competing hypotheses, or ACH for short. When you're dealing with a problem or trying to work out what's going on around you, it's easy to become focused on the first theory that pops into mind. By becoming focused on that one theory, you, without even realising it, sometimes shut your mind off to any alternative explanations and any conflicting evidence that may come your way. At its simplest, the ACH will just help you stay that bit more open-minded because it invites you to consider, as the name suggests, competing hypotheses. That just means other ideas. To follow it a little bit further, ACH then invites you to take those hypotheses and assess the strength of each of them according to the evidence that you've gathered in relation to your particular problem. That might sound a bit complex, but let me use an example to demonstrate how simple it really is. Some of you may remember Bob and Mary from an earlier session. If not, Bob had baked a lemon meringue pie, put it on his windowsill to cool, and someone had stolen it. Because Bob didn't particularly like Mary and thought she was a bit weird, he decided she was probably the person responsible, where in fact it turned out to have been a fox who'd stolen the pie. Had Bob applied ACH to his thinking, he may ar have arrived at the right conclusion a lot sooner. ACH asks us to use a table format, where we put our hypotheses along the top and list our evidence along the side. So in our example here, we're trying to find out who stole the pie. Now obviously Bob is a little bit fixated on Mary as a culprit, but if he was feeling a bit more open-minded, he may be able to generate a few more ideas. For the sake of this example, we're going to have Mary as a possible culprit alongside another neighbour and the fox. Now this is a very simplistic world, so the evidence is going to reflect that. So for us to figure out who stole the pie, the evidence suggests that the culprit would have to like lemon meringue pie. As it happens, all three of our possible culprits like lemon meringue pie, so they each get a plus alongside their names. The culprit would also have to be underhand. Now, this makes Bob think, because although he doesn't like Mary, and it's because she's a little bit strange, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's underhand. And he thinks all his other neighbours are lovely, so they're not underhand either. So it's just the fox who can be a little bit sneaky. And finally, the last piece of evidence is that the person would have to be, or animal, would have to be physically able to get the pie and take it away. Now, as it happens, Mary had recently broken her leg and Bob knew this. So he knows that she wouldn't be physically able to steal the pie, but he's not aware of anything wrong with his other neighbours or with the fox. So Mary gets a minus sign, whereas the other two get pluses. Now, in deciding which of the hypotheses is the strongest, we simply add up the total number of pluses against each one. So in this example, Mary actually scores the lowest with one, but it's the fox who comes out on top with three. In the real world, we don't necessarily have the time to be making these tables to assess the strength of different ideas, but at the very least, just remember this term ACH, remember what it stands for, analysis of competing hypotheses and let that be the trigger for you to remember to consider more than one explanation. It's a simple trick to help you stay open-minded and reach more accurate conclusions or better decisions. I'll see you at the next DQ session.